Okay, good morning everyone. Happy snow day. Um, we are going to jump right back into lectures, uh, but just as a reminder, all of the uh, undergraduates and grad those taking the course for graduate credit, you are both working on your first weekly report in which you're going to map out for us how you're going to approach your final projects, uh, final projects over the next four weeks. Uh, if you're coming up with an idea of your own, rather than picking something from the predefined list, remember to please come see uh, Freya, the TA, or myself uh, to vet the idea. Okay, so uh, back to uh, lecture material. We're working our way through uh, open problems in the field, and we've been uh, wrestling with the, arguably the hardest problem in the field, which is to cross the reality gap. We looked at the original formulation back in the 90s. We looked at the Golem pro project in 2000. And we are just about to finish lecture 17, which was my own attempt to try and cross the reality gap uh, back in 2006, where the idea was to evolve simulations that more closely match the robot's reality. Uh, in this particular experiment, the, the simulators are trying to match basically the body of the robot. So we're evolving not necessarily the simulator itself, but the simulated robot so that its body more closely matches uh, the robots. As you may remember from last time, I told you that the Resilient Machines project contains three different evolutionary algorithms. The first one evolves populations of simulations. The second evolutionary algorithm uses the most fit uh, simulation. You can see that this simulation is more fit than these three. This one more closely matches the robot's reality. The second evolutionary algorithm <coughs> evolves neural controllers uh, inside this evolved simulation, where the fitness function is whatever we actually want the robot to do, which is surprise, surprise, to move from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Okay, so just to uh, refresh your memory and build, uh, help to strengthen your intuition about how all this works, I want you to think about the phenotype in this first evolutionary algorithm. The genotype is some data structure, which we don't need to talk about here. The phenotype is how all the parts are put together, how big or small these parts are. Basically, the robot is trying to construct in a simulation a description of its own body. What is the fitness of any one of these bodies in the simulator, the simulator itself? The fitness is calculated as the similarity between the simulated robot's sensor values Remember that this robot has two vestibular sensors on board, one that measures how much the, main, the robot's main body tilts left and right, and the second vestibular sensor measures how much the robot tilts forward and back, so two numbers. The physical robot collects two physical sensor readings, how much it tilted left and right or forward and back after moving. And each of these four simulated robots also collects two numbers, which is how much its main body tilted. We take the difference between the simulated and physical robot's sensor values. And fitness tries to reduce this value. The more similar, uh, the more similar virtual and real, sen simulated and real sensor data is, the more fit that simulator is. Okay. I'm gonna come back, we'll come back to this green one in a moment. I've been holding off on this one for a little bit. <laughs> In the, uh, in the third one, uh, this is the more, one that's probably more familiar to you, the phenotype is the robot's neural controller, and fitness is how far does that neural co controller get the virtual robot to move. Okay, so let's back up for a moment and think about this third evolutionary algorithm. You'll remember that when we were watching the videos last time, the physical robot would do something, then the, simulated, the simulators would be evolved, to match it, then the new physical robot would do something else and the simulators would be re-evolved or evolved further to explain the first and the second experience of the robot. But I haven't told you yet how that robot chooses how to move. It turns out that there are better or worse ways that this robot can move to explore its own body. You might remember uh, from the videos I showed last time that the very first thing the robot did was to rotate motors one and five down, its left 
uh, its left knee and its left hip. Motors one and five down, lift all the others up. Then it evolved, uh, it evolved virtual bodies to uh, explain that experience. What is the worst possible action the robot can perform next to learn more about its own body? I'll give you a moment to think about that. The worst possible thing the robot could do would be to perform exactly the same action. Rotate motors one and five down and collect that data. Now, that's not always true. From time to time, it makes sense to repeat previous actions just to test whether something has changed. Like, for example, the robot's leg has broken off, and I showed you an, an example of that last time. But for the moment, we're going to assume that, that the robot's relatively sure things are unchanging, it's relatively safe. In that case, obviously doing the same action over and over again is the worst possible thing you could do. The best possible thing to do is to explore, is to try something new. But what exactly do we mean by to try something new? It could be just something other than rotate motors one and five down, and there's obviously a ton of things that it could do. Some of those things may be a little bit redundant. It may end up uh, experiencing a familiar sensation. How do we truly ensure that the robot does something that extracts new information about itself from the world? Here's how. I, uh, I'm going to explain that by now talking about this third evolutionary algorithm called exploration, which is going to evolve ways in which the physical robot should move next. So the robot is going to quote unquote, think using this third evolutionary algorithm about what to do next, where the goal about what to do next is to make sure it gets new sensory information that helps it improve its understanding of itself. Okay, let's imagine that at this particular point in time, the physical robot has performed, performed a couple actions, it's got a fair bit of experience, and it's evolved these four different simulators, these four different understandings of itself. And as you can see, one of them actually is correct and the other three are wrong. But remember, the robot doesn't have a camera. It can't see itself. It doesn't know that this one is correct. These four, let's assume for now, are all able to reproduce the sensations of this robot when we supply however many actions the physical robot has performed to these virtual robots. Every time this physical robot moved in a particular way, when we cause any of these four to move with that action, that virtual robot generates the same sensory information. So the robot is looking for a way to try and figure out which, if any of these, is correct, or maybe determine that none of them are correct, and they should all be thrown away and repl replaced with something better. So what should the robot do next to investigate or figure out where and where these uh, models of itself are wrong. Okay, let's imagine a the robot uh, generates some random neural controller, it thinks up some random way to move. The physical robot doesn't carry it out yet. So the robot is thinking to itself, I wonder what would happen if I ran this neural controller. The robot takes that neural controller, it's perhaps random, and it drops it in to each of the four under models it has of itself at the moment. So these four different bodies are running exactly the same brain. But as you can see with these cartoon green arrows, the way in which each of these four virtual robots moves is very different. And remember, we're going to collect vestibular sensation from this main block. We're getting back two numbers from each of these green blocks. How much the robot tilts left and right and how much it tilts forward and back. You can see that in this case, all of the green blocks are tilting in different ways. In essence, these are the robot's four self models. It's four understandings of itself saying, Okay, if you carry out this, if you, if you run this neural controller, you're going to move in this way. This self-model says, no, 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 you're crazy. You're not going to move like this. You're going to move like this. The third model says, you're both nuts. You're both wrong. If we run this neural controller, this is what's going to happen. If he runs this neural controller, this is what's going to happen, and so on. These self-models disagree 
in their predictions about sensory data if the physical robot runs it. They disagree in their predictions about the sensory repercussions of that action. That's a lot. I'll give you a minute to soak that in. So in the exploration algorithm over here, every time the physical robot is about to move, it's going to run this algorithm for a bit using the current self models to figure out a good new way to move. If all of these four self models disagree about what's going to happen, then if the physical robot actually runs that neural controller, they can't all be right. Some of them are gonna be wrong. The physical vestibular sensation uh, experienced by the robot is going to have a mismatch with the vestibular sensation of some of these models. And in this case, these three models, which we know are wrong, are probably going to drop in fitness. And this one, beca because we know that this self model is very close to the robot's actual self, there is going to be a good match between this vestibular sensation and this vestibular sensation. So the fitness of this individual probably will not change. The fitness of these three will drop when the robot goes back to evolving models of itself. And this model will produce randomly modified copies of itself. And very quickly, this population is going to be filled with slightly different versions of this. Okay, so this exploration uh, algorithm is evolving, uh, it's evolving actions or things to do. It's evolving a set of synaptic weights for a controller that causes the robot to act. And the fitness of each of these individual neural controllers is the amount of prediction disagreement among the four self models or however many self models there are. This is all done in simulation. Okay. Um, this has an interesting connection to developmental psychology, developmental psychology being the study of children or how children develop into adults. Um, if you've ever spent any time around a baby or a toddler, you will know that they are always moving and they never seem to repeat the same action twice. They're always doing crazy things, putting stuff in their mouths, hitting their brothers and sisters with a uh, toy mallet, you, you name it. This is known as motor babbling. This is the idea that a newborn baby or a newborn organism is trying to figure out how to operate this fantastically complicated machine, and they're randomly trying out all sorts of things. If you go back and watch the videos in this lecture series of just the physical robot, all the actions that it performs, which are being sent to it by the exploration algorithm, if you watch all the actions that that robot performs, they all look different. They kind of, you don't really see any pattern to them or repetition to them. They look random. But as you now know, those actions are not chosen at random. These actions are actually carefully designed inside the mind of the robot, if you like to break its own predictions. It has ideas about what's going to happen and it's trying out things for which it's least certain about what's going to happen. When we wrote this paper that suggested to us uh, an interesting idea which has yet to be confirmed or denied in actual human children, which is maybe children are not actually acting randomly. They are actually choosing very, very carefully what to do, which is an action designed to try and break or disprove their current understandings of themselves. Just uh, just an aside. Okay. All right. We are going to finish the Resilient Machines uh, discussion here. And returning to the schedule for a moment, we are going to now uh, talk about the fourth and final attempt to cross the reality gap that we're going to look at in this class. As I mentioned, there are many, many attempts to do this. Um, we're going to look at this one here, which has uh, some particularly interesting aspects that might be useful for your final project. Okay. Okay, so this is known as the transferability project for a very good reason. What they're going to try and do now is evolve controllers in simulation uh, on a virtual robot like we've seen many times before and then send some of those evolved controllers 
to a physical robot, but they're going to evolve these controllers not just to maximize the movement of the virtual robot, they're going to try and maximize, the fitness function is also gonna try and maximize the transferability of a controller, how well it will transfer to reality if we send it to reality. So the question that the authors of this study started with is, could the transferability of a controller be added to a fitness function? That's their question. Like every good question in science, it immediately breeds a whole bunch of other questions. The first one that might have occurred to you as you first saw this question is, what exactly do you mean by transferability? Okay, we'll come back to that, uh, how to define it in a moment. If we're gonna try and add transferability to a controller, that means we're gonna have two, we're gonna compute two values in our fitness function. One is going to compute the desired behavior, which as you're gonna see in a moment, surprise, surprise, how far the robot moves from the left to the right. So we're going, one fitness term is going to reward for displacement. The second uh, term in the fitness function is gonna reward for transferability which the authors define as the similarity between the simulated and real behavior. So if the, if the simulated robot moves like this and the physical robot moves like this, uh, low transferability. If the simulated robot moves like this and the physical robot moves like this, high transferability. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? So we've got these two terms that we're going to... Uh, uh, we're, the, we're gonna, these two terms are going to be used to compute the quality of a given set of synaptic weights for a neural controller in an evolving population of neural controllers. Okay. Instead of multiplying these two terms together or adding them together in the way that we've seen many times now in this course, they're going to do something different. This is known as Mu, uh, an easily to, uh, easy to remember adjective, which stands for multi-objective optimization. What the, uh, the best way to understand multi-objective optimization is to understand it geometrically. So here we go. We're going to create a two-dimensional plane, and we're going to define two different axes. The horizontal axis down here is going to represent how transferable a given controller is and the vertical axis is going to represent how well that controller causes the robot to move from left to right, the behavior that we want. Imagine we have a population made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, a population of 12 controllers. So we've got a population of 12 vectors where each vector encodes synaptic weights for a neural controller. We can take each of those 12 controllers, drop it into the virtual robot, evaluate that virtual robot in simulation, and measure the behavior of that virtual robot. How far does that robot move? And we can plot uh, the height, we can drop that point at a height corresponding to how well that controller causes the robot to move. So this controller, which is high in the plot, caused the robot to move uh, a far distance from left to right. And this point, this controller down here, caused the robot to barely, virtual robot to move barely at all. If we can also measure the transferability of a controller, how well it transfers from simulation to reality, we can plot that transferability on the horizontal axis. So let's imagine for the moment we have these 12 controllers. We've evaluated each of them on the virtual robot. We know how well they uh, ca cause the robot to exhibit the behavior we want. We take each of those 12 controllers and we evaluate it on the physical robot as well. And we look at the gap in behavior between the virtual robot and the physical robot. If there, is, uh, if there is a big gap, so up here we know that that controller caused the virtual robot to move a far distance. When we transferred it to the physical robot, let's assume for the robot, for the moment, the ro physical robot didn't move at all. There's a big gap between simulated and physical behavior, which means low transferability. 
This one, this controller out here, caused the robot to barely move at all, caused the virtual robot to move barely at all. And when we transfer it to reality, let's assume the physical robot also did not move very much. There's a good match. There's a low difference between the behavior of the simulated and physical robot. We have high transferability. If we do that for all 12 of the controllers, we get a picture that looks like this. Some are good at objective two and poor at objective one. Some are good at objective one, but poor at objective two. Some are pretty bad at both. This one is kind of okay at both. Everybody see that? Now, you might already be wondering, if, we're trans if we need to compute the transferability of every controller, and in order to do that, we have to send every controller to the physical robot, why are we using simulation at all? Why don't we just evaluate every controller on the physical robot? It's a good question. Um, that's not what the what the authors did. They came up with a way of estimating transferability for each controller after it had been run on the simulated robot without having to send it to the physical robot. I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want us to focus on multi-objective optimization because some of you in your final project are already thinking about multiple terms for your fitness function. If you want, uh, if you want a robot to jump, one objective might be for uh, all four feet to spend as little time on the ground as possible. And the second objective might be height of the main body of the robot. You can actually formulate two different objectives for jumping. And you could uh, evolve jumping for your robot in a multi-objective optimization way. Okay, so let's come back to move for a moment. We'll come back to how to actually compute transferability for a controller before we send it to reality. But for now, let's, let's assume we're just able to compute transferability. You can see that we now have these 12 initially random neural controllers spread throughout this two-dimensional space. In an evolutionary algorithm, we now need to delete the ones that have low fitness and make randomly modified copies of the surviving controllers. Given this picture, which controllers do you think we delete in this case? I'll give you a moment to think about this. The way we choose which ones are to be deleted in a multi-objective optimization method is to find all of the controllers which are dominated. What do we mean by dominated? A dominated solution is one in which there is one, at least one other controller in the population that is better at both objectives. For example, if we look at this controller down here, we see this controller here is more transferable. It's further to the right than this one. And this controller also produces more of the desired behavior that we want. This controller is higher than this controller. So this particular controller is dominated <coughs> by this controller. So we would delete this controller. In turn, if we now look, if we now come to this controller and try and decide whether this one should be deleted, we see that it is also dominated. It's dominated by this one. This one is both more transferable, is better in terms of objective one, and it's better at objective two than this one. So this, con this controller dominates this one. This one is also dominated. We would delete this one. You can probably see where this is going. This one is dominated by this one. So we delete this one. And now there is, for this controller, there is no other controller that is better at objective one and objective two. There is no controller that is above and to the right of this controller. So this controller is non-dominated. You can probably do this by eye or better to even do this with your cursor by picking one and finding another one that dominates it. You can probably go through and determine who is about to be deleted in this population and who's going to survive. Okay, so here are all the ones that are dominated and here are all the ones that are non-dominated. Uh, when I made this slide originally, I made a mistake. One of them is mislabeled and I'll give you a moment to see if you can figure it out.
it's this one. This one is actually non-dominated. You'll notice that if you look at this one, there is no other controller that is above and to the right of this controller. Okay, so you'll see that I've connected all of these non-dominated solutions with a line. There should really be a line going from this one to this one, and then from this one to this one. Okay. Okay, so we've deleted all of these, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven survivors, and we have five empty slots in our population. How do we know, now choose who to, uh, who, who, how, who do we choose, sorry, among these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, among these seven parents, how do we choose which one gets to produce a child? We do it at random. Among all of these seven individuals, None of them are better than any others. For every single one, and you can do that by walking along this line, uh, they're all, for each of them, there's another one that's better at one objective, but worse at the other objective. So this is what's a little bit confusing about Moo for most people. In your evolutionary algorithms and all the evolutionary algorithms we've seen so far, we compute the fitness for everything in the population. And then there is always a champion. There is one individual in the population that has the highest fitness. There is the best solution so far. In Mu, that's usually not true. There are usually a subset of solutions that are all uh, optimal. Um, this is known as Pareto, uh, uh, Pareto optimality. Uh, you can Google it, P-A-R-E-T-O, Pareto optimality. <clears throat> Okay, so we choose one of these seven parents at random with uniform uh, with a uniform probability. So any of the seven has an equal chance of being chosen. We choose it. We copy all the synaptic weights of that neural controller into a new child controller to fill one of the five empty slots. And as we're copying the synaptic weights, we make a few random modified changes to the child. So now we've filled one of the five slots. We go back and pick another one of the seven parents at random. Uh, it's allowed to produce a child, which fills, fills a second uh, slot. And we keep going until we now have five new children and we have the original seven parents. In my example here, let's imagine that this particular parent produced this child. When we got this child, we. When we've created all five children and we evaluated this child, it had this transferability and this ability to uh, generate the desired behavior in the virtual robot. You'll notice that this child is a little above and to the right of its parent. So when we come to the end of this new generation in which we've just evaluated all five of these new children, what do you think happens now? Which individuals are deleted? Obviously, this child dominates its parent. So this parent was non-dominated, but it was non-dominated. It's now become dominated, and it is in turn deleted. And if you now imagine running this multi-objective optimization over time, you can imagine this Pareto front, P-A-R-E-T-O, this Pareto front. Uh, Pareto is the name of the economist, actually, who came up with this idea. Uh, you can imagine this Pareto front starts to march up and to the right. We basically end up with a line of non-dominated solutions up here, all of which are pretty good at transferability and pretty good at behavior. Okay, so far so good? Okay. Okay, here's some actual data from the experiment. Uh, you'll notice there's a number of differences from my simplified cartoon version here and the real thing. Um, we've got the, the vertical axis is still the same as over here. They're measuring for each one of these, each one of these points, uh, these circles and crosses. Each one represents an individual neural controller. The height of that point represents uh, the distance covered by the, by the virtual robot in simulation measured uh, in me meters. And we're trying to maximize that. Okay. On the horizontal axis here, they're plotting uh, simulation to reality disparity. And we're trying to minimize that. So we're trying to minimize the gap or the disparity between 
uh, the simulated robot's behavior and the real robot's behavior. Better controllers are further to the left. There's less disparity between the behavior of the simulated robot for that controller and the behavior of the physical robot using, sorry, using that controller. Okay, so in this case here, we're trying to maximize transferability and a max, maximize displacement. So we're trying to push up and to the right. Here we're trying to maximize displacement and minimize uh, the gap, the sim to real gap. So now optimization is trying to push up and to the left. Everybody see that? Okay, again, I haven't really told you exactly how they compute uh, this disparity yet, but for our purposes, just imagine they send it from simulation to reality. Okay, let's have a look at all the X's first. You can see all the X's down here. Um, these are all the controllers at generation I. So this is partway through an evolutionary process. And you can see most of the X's are hugging the bottom right part of the, the panel. These aren't doing very well at all. They have high disparity and they're not causing the simulated robot to move very much. When we go from crosses to circles, black and white, where now the circles all represent controllers in the next generation, in the I plus one th generation. First thing you should notice is that the circles tend to be higher and to the left of the X's. So the optimization has made a little bit of progress here. And again, you'll see that the, like in my cartoon here, dominated solutions are shown as white circles and non-dominated solutions are shown as black circles. You'll now notice the black circles describe a Pareto front. These are the non-dominated controllers. And all the dominated controllers are behind, are below and to the right of that line. So what this plot is showing us as a whole is that evolution is starting to make progress. It's starting to evolve better controllers, controllers that cause the robot to do more of what we want, and they're more transferable controllers. These controllers are narrowing the gap between simulation and reality. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over, I'm gonna skip over this plot. Okay. Okay, so let's come back to uh, where this experiment is going. We just had a look at the particular kind of evolutionary algorithm they're gonna use to do this. They're going to evolve, uh, they're going to evolve controllers to be transferable and reward for the desired behavior. But how do we compute transferability? To compute transferability at the moment, all we know is the only way to do this for each, for each controller is to evaluate each one on the real robot. It's a bit of a problem. So how do we solve this problem? How do we compute transferability of a controller before we send it to reality? Okay, here's how the authors solved this problem. Let's imagine uh, we're starting this evolutionary algorithm. We have a population of random controllers. In this case, uh, uh, we can see them all here. We take each one of these random controllers and we drop it into the virtual robot, one after the other, and measure how well that controller causes the robot to move. So we have the heights for all of these gray points. Okay, we do not know how well any of these controllers transfer from simulation to reality. So geometrically, let's imagine that they all collapse down uh, onto a one dimensional line. So the only thing we have is the height of these points. We do not know their horizontal position in this two dimensional plane. So look at all the gray dots lined up on the black vertical line here. You can take one of these 12 controllers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You can take one of these 12 random controllers and send it to the physical robot to measure that controller's actual transferability. Which one do you send? Okay, hopefully uh, like me, you're an optimist and you choose this one. This is the one that's causing the virtual robot to exhibit uh, more of what you actually want. So let's give it a try. Maybe the reality gap is not so wide 
in whatever application this is. Okay, so here we go. We're going to take this one. Okay. Here it is in simulation. As you can see, it causes the robot to move from left to right. Maybe not in the way the investigators were originally expecting, but it does what we want. Okay, as you can see on the right, they're now going to take this one random neural controller and drop it into the physical robot. Okay, how do we do? As you can see here, we failed to cross the gap. This particular neural controller fell into the gap. So this controller is good at objective two, the vertical axis that I showed you before. It extracts a lot of the desired behavior in sim, but on the transferability axis, it's far to the far to the left. It has low transferability. Okay, so going back to our evolutionary algorithm, uh, we now take this uh, neural controller and we move it far to the left. We now know the actual transferability for this controller. Which one do you send next? Let's imagine you get to send another one. You're probably not going to send this one because this controller barely causes the virtual robot to move at all. So even if it's transferability, it has high transferability, who cares? It's not useful to us. You might also not want to transfer this one because this one, this one is actually quite close to this one, at least in terms of behavior. So it's possible that this neural controller is causing the robot to move in a similar way that doesn't transfer well to reality. So maybe we want to stay away from this stuff and maybe we want to stay away from this stuff and maybe we take this one or maybe we take this one. Okay. So the idea here, the intuition that you're going to see is they're going to start to estimate the transferability of the other controllers based on how similar the behavior is produced by that controller compared to controllers that have been sent to reality and for which we know their transferability. So said more simply, controllers that are closer to low, to controllers that have low transferability, we're going to estimate their transferability as low. And controllers that are far from controllers we've sent to reality, we're going to assume we know relatively little. We're not going to be able to estimate their transferability very well. Okay, let's see how they did this. Okay, so we're going to, uh, the solution to uh, com computing transferability for our evolving controllers before we send them to reality is to estimate each of their transferabilities based on how similar they are to controllers we've already tested on the physical robot. Okay. This raises yet another problem, which is how do you measure the similarity between behaviors? So going back to the cartoon here for a moment, just because this controller produced uh, about the same fitness value as this one, do we actually know how similar these behaviors are? We need a way to measure similarity between behavior, not just similarity between fitness. Fitness is just a single number, how far the robot traveled. We'd like to actually compare how, to ro how the robot moves when it's running two different controllers, this one and this one, for example. Okay, so let's see how they define similarity between two behaviors. They're going to define similarity by de defining a distance measure between any two behaviors. So whatever this distance measure is, if we take two behaviors produced by two different controllers and the distance between them is zero, that means the robot exhib exhibits identical behavior uh, when controlled by those two controllers. Okay. 
Before we can define a distance measure for behaviors, we need to de define the behaviors themselves. In this case, in this experiment, uh, instead of measuring every single sensor value at every time step, they came up with something that was a little simpler. They boiled down the movement of, uh, of the robot into three floating point numbers, F1, F2, and F3. F1, the total distance traveled by the robot. F2 is the mean height, the average height of the robot during travel. And uh, Fitness 3 was the final orientation of the robot. You might remember from last time I showed you the injured uh, quadruped that started facing forward and as it walked, it ended by facing backwards. So they're gonna compute the final ori horizontal orientation of the robot uh, in radians just a third number. So we've got a neural controller, which is defined as a whole bunch of floating point values, the synaptic weights. We take that vector, label the neural controller of the robot, let the robot do its thing in simulation. And as it's doing its thing in simulation, we measure these three numbers. How far does the robot travel? What's its mean height? And what's its final orientation? We can then compute the distance between any two behaviors by taking the Euclidean distance between these, uh, between two length three vectors. That's what's shown down here. So the behavioral distance between controller one and controller two is in this experiment defined as the Euclidean distance between B1, this behavioral vector, and B2. Yeah, since this is a, a triplet of numbers, you can think of these three numbers uh, as X, Y, Z coordinates. So you can think of a controller producing a behavior that sits somewhere in three-dimensional space. So controller one produces B1 that sits here in three-dimensional space. Controller two produces B2, which sits here in three-dimensional space. And the behavioral distance is the Euclidean distance between these two points in three-dimensional space. That's what it is, yeah? If these two points, B1 and B2, sit right on top of one another, those two controllers produced identical behavior in the robot. That behavior could be, in both cases, the robot sits still, or in both cases, the robot does this, or in both cases, the robot does this, doesn't really matter, yeah? So we're gonna see as we move forward, we're gonna see a lot of C's and B's. Remember C sub I is, gonna, is going to reference the ith controller in the population, and B sub I is going to denote the behavior produced by that controller. Okay, so now that we've defined the distance between any two behaviors, how do we define the transferability of a single controller I? I'll give you a moment to think about that. We're going to define the transferability of C sub I as a function of, uh, as the controller, uh, as the, as the uh, behavioral distance between, the, the behavioral distance between the behavior produced by controller I in simulation and the behavior produced by controller I in reality. Yeah? Remember B, behavioral distance between two controllers? Behavioral distance between the same controller, but evaluated in two different robots, the simulated robot and the real robot. Okay. And we're going to define the transferability of C sub I as the minus, the negative of that. Give you a moment to think about why the negative of that. Behavioral distance is a distance uh, metric. Every distance metric by definition is a positive number. A negative distance is an ill-defined term. So everything in this particular term here, uh, behavioral distance is always a positive number. And the more positive that number is, the bigger the distance or the bigger the difference between the two behaviors. So we can set transferability to be the minus of that. The more negative the right-hand side of this equation is, the more, uh, sorry, the, 
uh, the le sorry, the less negative, the less negative this uh, this thing is to the right of the equal sign, the more transferable it is. So because behavioral distance is always positive, we know that whenever we compute this thing, it's always going to be negative. And the more negative it is, the bigger the gap, the bigger the reality gap. So transferability is trying to minimize that gap, get it as close to zero as possible. Okay, some of these sort of double negatives, a negative difference between things. Yeah, we want this thing to be as high as possible, to be as uh, leastly, leastly, leastly negative as possible. Okay, again, we're back to uh, computing transferability of a controller based on simulation and reality. So this is only, we're gonna use this, we're gonna use this equation only for those controllers that we have sent from simulation to reality. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, imagine we have 12 controllers and we take the best one and we send it to reality. And so now we know the transferability of that one neural controller. We need to estimate the transferability of the remaining 11 neural controllers that we have not yet sent to reality. How do we do that? Well, let's go to the second controller, the first of the 11 that we're going to try and estimate transferability for. We can't compute transferability for it because we haven't sent it to reality yet. We're going to estimate it uh, in the following way. Assume this controller is called C. We're going to compute the behavioral distance between controller C and controller CI, where controller CI belongs to the set of already transferred controllers. At this point, this set, CT, contains only one member. It contains the, control, that, the best controller, the one that we sent to reality. So we're computing the behavioral distance between C we take C and drop it into the virtual robot and compute and watch its behavior. And we have, we also know uh, how C sub I, the one that we sent to reality, we know how that causes the virtual robot to move. So we can compute the behavioral distance between C and C sub I. And we're going to sum up these behavioral distances. We're going to sum up these behavioral distances over all the ones that we've sent to reality, which the moment is only one. We're going to actually take a weighted sum. We're going to sum up the transferability, how transferable was C sub I, the one that we sent to reality, how well did it cross the gap, and we're going to add it to our estimate of the transferability of C. We're going to, we're going to decrease the weight of this particular weighted sum by the behavioral distance between C and C sub I. So we're summing up all the transferabilities. We're basically taking the average of all the transferabilities of all the controllers we've sent to reality. So if we're trying to figure out how transferable this one is, we can look at all the ones we've sent so far and say our best guess for the transferability of C is the average transferability of all the ones we've sent to reality so far. That's okay, that's a good guess, but we can do better. Instead of just taking the average, we can take the weighted average. The influence on the weighted average is going to be modulated by how close C sub I is to C. The more similar the behavior produced by C sub I and C, the greater this weight. We're dividing by behavioral distance. So going back to my cartoon for a moment, this one, if this one actually had been, uh, sorry, if we're trying to compute the transferability of this one, the transferability of this one has a greater weight or greater influence on the estimate of transferability for this one than, for example, this one, if we did send it to reality. Okay. Takes a moment to wrap your mind around that, right? Here's a, here's a geometric way of thinking about it. We're trying to estimate... We're trying to estimate the transferability of C. We have a bunch of other C's out there that have been transferred to reality and they have different transferabilities. If one is close and that one had low transferability, then I, I'm going to estimate that I have low transferability. 
One that's very far from me that had high transferability, that might increase my my estimate of my own transferability a little bit, but only a little bit because that other one is far from me. It's behaviorally distant. Okay, so we can use this equation to estimate the transferability of this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And using that estimate, you would get something that kind of looks like this. This one, this controller that's close to this one, we're going to estimate it has a close, it has a, cl uh, a similar transferability. This one, it's probably not going to differ that much from the mean. Okay. Okay, so we've in my cartoon example, we took that really good controller, sent it to reality. It had terrible transferability. We've got 11 remaining. Which one would you pick? We've estimated the transferability of all of these. Which one do you send next? The intuition of the authors is that you're going to send the controller which is most different from those in the current population. So among the remaining 11, you're going to pick the one out of those 11 that's as far from the other 11 controllers in the population as possible, or that's most different from the others in the population. What do we mean by most different? How do we know for any given controller in the population how different it is from the other 11? We can use behavioral distance again. Okay, so we're trying to determine how different C is, one of the 12 controllers in the population. So we're going to compare it, we're gonna compare it against all the other controllers that we've sent to reality so far. And we're looking, we're going to set the diversity of C to be the minimum behavioral distance of C from all those we've transferred to reality. And we're going to call this diversity. So let's go back to my cartoon for a moment. In this case, we've sent this one to reality. We visit this one and we compute its behavioral distance to this one. And that distance is very, very, very small. Let's assume we send this one to reality also and it ends up with a high transferability. So we've tra we, have, we have this one here, which we've transferred to reality. We have this one down here, which we've transferred to reality. And sorry about jumping around here. We're taking, we're trying to compute the diversity of C. So we wanna take the minimum behavioral distance and set that as the diversity of C. This one has a low behavioral distance. To this one and it has a high behavioral distance to this one down here so we're taking the minimum of those two behavioral distances one that's very large and one that's very small so the diversity of this one is very low okay let's compute the diversity of this one Let's assume again, we've transferred this one to reality and this one to reality. So this one has a behavioral distance that's pretty high. And this behavioral distance here, which is less. So the behavioral distance between this controller and this one is this much. It's, but it's the, it's the smaller of the two between this behavioral distance and this behavioral distance. This one is smaller, so we set the diversity of this one to this distance. Remember that the diversity of this one was this distance. So this controller is more diverse or more unique than this one. This one is more similar to one we've already transferred. Everybody see that? Okay. Let's do one more. This one down here, it's got a behavioral distance of this and a behavioral distance of this. Of the two, this one, this is the minimal one. The minimum one is this behavioral distance. So this one is also quite unique. This one has high diversity. This one has high diversity. This one has very low diversity. Okay, so we're computing diversity for all the controllers in the population. 
And then we're going to take among all of those, the one that we send next is the one that has highest diversity. It's the one that's most different in the population. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back for a moment to, let's go back to here. Okay. So we have all of these controllers. We've evaluated all of them on the virtual robot. For one of them or a couple of them in the population, we've actually sent them to reality. So for those, we know their actual transferability. And for the rest, we have estimated transferability in the way we just talked about. We can assume that these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven have survived. These five have died off and we've reached the end of one generation. And now at each generation, at that generation, we can send one new one to uh, reality. And we're gonna send the one uh, that has highest diversity, which is not shown on this picture here. So among these seven parents, among the seven survivors, we compute the diversity of them. We are not gonna send this one or this one, if we're assuming that we've sent both of these to reality already, we're gonna choose one of these five and compute the diversity of these five and try and it's probably going to be this one this one is for probably has the greatest behavioral distance from the two that we've sent so far so every generation like in your code we're evaluating every controller in simulation and among all of them we get to send one to reality keep going and we evolve this we evolve this population and we start to evolve uh controllers that cause the virtual robot these points start to rise in the space. We start to evolve controllers that cause the virtual robot to exhibit more of the behavior we want. And these points are also moving to the right. Generally speaking, as we take these controllers and transfer them from simulation to reality, the gap is narrowing. What does it mean that the gap is narrowing? Well, as you'll recall, when we transferred the first when we transferred the first random controller in that in generation zero, it had low transferability. There was a big gap between what the simulated robot did and what the physical robot did. At the end of the evolutionary run, after 200 generations, oops, I'm sorry. After 200 generations, they had this controller that had high, uh, had high, was good at objective two, and also high estimated transferability. The evolutionary algorithm thinks that this one actually will cross the gap. And it was right. So this bottom pair of images is showing you a controller that is up and to the right in that cartoon. It's good at objective one, at crossing the gap, and it's good at getting the robot to do what we want it to do, move from left to right. Okay, the last part of this experiment that I wanna leave you with is a mystery that nobody's been able to solve since 2010, so we're going on 14 years now. Look at the left pair of images. It's not the same controller, but it certainly produces something that looks very similar. It produces a very similar behavior. And yet, one of them is very transferable and the other one is not. You might remember in the Golem project when we were looking at all these pyramids being printed out by 3D printers, we could kind of come up for an, with an intuition for why some robots or some behaviors transferred from simulation to reality. This a uh, quartet of videos is a good reminder about how difficult the reality gap is. It's actually not very intuitive. I've watched these videos hundreds if not thousands of times and I cannot tell what it is about the mass distribution of this robot, the friction properties, acceleration, deceleration, uh, jerk, snap, crackle, and pop, if you know what those are. Very difficult to tell what's going on here. Okay. All right, we have uh, 15 minutes left. Um, so we are going to return 
to our schedule here and we'll start in on lecture 19, but just to recap and review where we've been, uh, we have finished uh, our section on crossing the reality gap. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you for how difficult this problem actually is. We're going to, in lecture 19, look at one final challenge that exists, uh, that existed and still exists in robotics, which is scalability. Um, so there are 61 of you in this class. Each one of you, I hope, has successfully implemented all 10 assignments and or all five differentiable assignments. You're all coding up new kinds of robots now in your final project or coding up different fitness functions or creating different environments for your robots. I'm sure you're all going to be successful over the next four months, uh, over the next four weeks. And then your there will, we will have 61 abandoned code bases and I will have to start all over again with a fresh set of students next year. That's also true of our graduate students. They work on a robot or robots or the projects that you just saw, for example, for two, three or four years and then move on to something else. If we're really going to solve robotics, robotics is a really, really hard problem. We're probably going to have to have hundreds or thousands of humans building, training, uh, uh, build, uh, building robots in simulation, training them, manufacturing them in reality, deploying them out there. How do we, how do we build a larger and larger human team? which is all bent to the same purpose, which is to design increasingly competent and safe machines. Okay, to scale that up, uh, one obvious approach is to try and use the idea of crowdsourcing to incentivize people to want to come and participate, um, even if they have relatively little technical skills. Is there a way we can build a large human team to collectively design robots where some folks in the team are more technically inclined than others. So in lecture 19, we're going to look at a project uh, that, that started in my lab and is now known as Twitch Plays Robotics, um, which is an attempt to recruit uh, large numbers of people from the internet to collectively guide the evolutionary process uh, of an evolutionary robotics experiment. Okay. All right. So before we talk about uh, robots and Twitch and crowdsourcing, let's go back to uh, an unlikely source. Let's start with the Chinese room problem. Um, if we want a large number of people, um, some of whom have relatively little technical skills to collectively guide an experiment, we can't assume that they know how to code or that they know math. The most obvious thing to do is to allow them to use natural language to guide the evolutionary robotics experiment. Um, so what you're going to see in Twitch Plays Robotics is a website that allows people to speak directly to robots. They can talk to them in natural language. You might remember from the Chinese room problem that uh, if we have now a robot inside the Chinese room and someone in Mandarin tells the robot to jump, all the robot hears is the letter J followed by the letter U followed by the letter M followed by the letter P. That word is meaningless to the robot. So we got a problem. We want to bring together a large number of non-technical folks um, in which the only common language they have is literally language, a natural language. But robots don't uh, understand natural language. So how are, how are they going to, how are we going to connect these two groups? The evolving robot that doesn't understand English, we're going to switch to English in a moment, and a whole bunch of non-technical folks who are trying to tell the robot what to do in English. Okay. There's been attempts to do this for a very long time. Um, this is just optional and as an aside, if you're interested in the history of AI, you should definitely check out the Psych Project by Doug Lanat. It's arguably one of the longest running AI experiments uh, in history. It's been going since 1984. If you Google it, you can go to the Psych Project website. Okay, um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over this. Um, how do we understand language? Uh, language seems like something that is very uh, non-embodied. We've spent a lot of time in this course talking about uh, embodiment. But in recent years, neuroscientists have started to discover that there is actually a very strong connection between language 
and our embodiment. Um, and I'm going to show you some of that evidence first. It turns, as you're going to see in the Twitch Plays Robotics Project, we can use some of these ideas from neuroscience to allow a robot to actually start to understand natural language, to understand English. Okay, so how does this work? It turns out that in your brain, there is what's known as the motor strip. Uh, if you're to wear some headphones or earmuffs, exactly where the stra strap would go, that's where the motor strip is. Um, if, uh, if I were to put you in a, a brain scanner and to touch your thumb, this particular part of the motor strip would light up. If I were to then tap your index finger, the next point, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. We're talking about the motor strip, motor meaning muscles. If I put you in a brain scanner and I asked you to twitch your thumb, this part of your motor strip would light up. If I asked you to twitch your index finger, a place right next door in your brain in the motor strip would light up. So it turns out that along the motor strip here is all of your body parts organized in this particular way. So in your brain, the place where you dream up actions, I want to move my thumb, I want to move my index finger, I want to move my thumb on my other hand, those imaginary, those motor plans, things that you're planning to do, they tend to, they may not originate here, but at least they cause that part of your brain to light up. And it's not an arbitrary sequence. It's actually lined up uh, where neighboring body parts, if you actuate them or you actuate them with your motors, your muscles light up neighboring parts of your motor strip. Um, you'll notice that there is one part of the human anatomy or a few parts that are not shown on here. Um, the parts that are shown larger here, these are the parts that are more sensitive in which uh, more parts of the motor strip light up. You can imagine what those missing parts are and they have very large, uh, they take up a lot of real estate in the brain's motor strip. Okay, what does that have to do with language and robots? We'll see in a moment. Let's keep going. Here's a, here's a very interesting neuroscience experiment in which they put, uh, they put subjects into a brain scanner and the human subjects were asked to just relax and just quietly listen to random words being spoken uh, into their ears. Those words were things like talk, lick, grasp, pick, walk, and kick. Let's look at the words lick, pick, and kick. They sound very similar. So you might think naively that similar sounding words are going to light up similar uh, closely uh, parts of the brain of your brain that are close to one another in your brain. Similar sounding brains are likely to light up regions that are similarly situated near one another. It turns out that's not what happened. It turns out that the word talk and lick, which sound quite different, at least more different than lick, pick, and kick. The words talk and lick, uh, those two words do light up two brain regions that are very near one another in the motor strip, in that part of your brain that would be covered by the strap of some headphones. Similarly, the words grasp and pick, which also sound different, light up closely, uh, uh, closely situated uh, regions in the brain, and finally walk and kick. Where in the brain are they lighting this up? They're lighting it up near the face-related parts of the motor strip, and specifically uh, the mouth, the mouth parts of what's known as the motor homunculus. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Um, the homunculus has a very long and entertaining history in neuroscience and philosophy. Um, people often thought we are conscious because there's a little man inside of us uh, who's directing what we do. Problem with the, mo the homunculus theory of consciousness, of course, is what's in the head of the homunculus. So the idea of the homunculus was kind of laughed out of uh, philosophy and psychology in the early 20th century, but the neuroscientist had the last laugh. It turns out there is a little man or woman or person uh, inside your body, and uh, inside your brain, and they're right here. This is the motor homunculus. 
Okay, so as you're lying quietly, if you were to lie quietly in a brain scanner and hear these words, it seems like, and this is this is a bit of a stretch, this is just the data, but if you then extrapolate from this data, it suggests that when you hear the word talk, you imagine yourself talking. You're playing with motor plans, things you might try in reality. We just finished a lecture segment on Sim to Real. You do Sim to Real all the time. Not everything you dream up in Sim uh, makes it to reality. So as you hear the word talk, you actually imagine yourself talking. As you hear the word lick, you think about yourself licking. When you hear the word grasp, you think of yourself grasping. As I continue with these next three words, watch yourself thinking. Pick, walk, kick. Did you see yourself imagining picking something up, walking, or kicking? That's what Pulvermüller and Fadiga's study seems to suggest. So neuroscience is starting to suggest that there is a very close connection between language and action. This is gonna be important for us because we want a robot that can understand the language of a large crowd and act accordingly. The crowd is going to, the crowd in the Twitch Plays Robotics Project, as we're going to see, is going to try and collectively evolve robots to jump or uh, jump or walk or run or sit down or stand up. So the robot has to learn a connection between jump, sit, walk, turn, and so on, and what to do. It turns out that we humans seem to be doing this all the time. As you're listening to language, you are imagining it is that language is triggering motor plans in the motor strip part of your brain, it seems. Uh, we'll finish, I think, with this today. Um, there is another uh, there's another stream of uh, evidence, another branch of evidence that suggests humans have a very close connection in their heads between language and action. And this evidence is the ubiquity of embodied metaphors in language. Uh, George Lakoff, a very famous uh, psychologist, pointed this out that uh, people tend to think of mathematics and poetry and language and chess as very, uh, very formidable, very laudable, very, you know, things to work towards to achieve very difficult things that have nothing to do with the body. Western thought has a very long history of denigrating the body. The body is dirty, temporary, prone to damage and death, but the mind and the soul is pure and is forever. Turns out that as we're learning from neuroscience and psychology, that's not the case. Even non-embodied things like language seem to have deep roots in our bodies. And you can see this by looking at language itself. Uh, if there are any non-native uh, English speakers that are listening to this lecture, uh, you might find this particularly interesting. In every language, there are idioms or metaphors that seem confusing. Um, if you're in an argument with someone and you're trying to advance your case and the person accuses you of jumping to conclusions, even if you're a non-native English speaker and you've never heard this idiom before, most non-native English speakers can figure out what it means without the English speaker having to explain what don't jump to conclusions means. What does it mean? It means don't jump to conclusions, but what is being jumped over? In an argument, you have to have a chain of reasoning, right? I, I, there's proof for this, and this suggests this, and there's proof for this, and this suggests you have to make your argument as a series of stepping stones. You can't jump over any of those chains in your logical argument to the conclusion, or else I don't trust your conclusion. Don't jump to conclusions. You might, uh, if somebody, uh, if somebody's uh, complaining to you about something that happened last week, you might admonish them to not look back in anger. This one is interesting. Why do we say look back, don't look back in anger? We also say, I look forward to seeing you all in class on Tuesday. In most cultures, the past, things that you're angry about in the past, are behind you. 
and things in the future, like seeing you all in class next Tuesday, that tends to be things that we look forward to. Why do we look back metaphorically to past events? We obviously can't literally see things that happened in our past, and I can't literally see you all until next Tuesday. Why is that? I'll leave you to think on that. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday. You have a quiz due tonight. You're all work working on your weekly reports, which are due by uh, midnight Monday night. Have a good rest of your week and enjoy the snow.